So everyone knows this feeling. Touchdown. Warriors down 16. Your team is down, but Boys, let's go down. there's a glimmer of hope. Curry gets free and hits. Then ignition sequence starts. Curry way down top. A comeback. Zero. Bang! And Patriots win the Super Bowl. Of course, not every comeback is a win, but why does it always seem like team stage one is this? Just a feeling, a misguided judgment of sorts, or Eight to three. does this actually tend to happen? The teams play better when they're losing. That play tougher. This is a story about one of the strangest phenomena in sports and in life. It's 1996 in Salt Lake City, and the Jazz are getting absolutely embarrassed on their home floor. The other high elevation team has done more than acclimate. The Nuggets are up 36 points in the first half. Folks, a smattering of booze. Yet in the second half, something odd starts to happen. Jump hook, got it. Here the half, Hornacek. Yes, 17 point lead. Alone again, 12 point game. Dr. The Jazz were going to win this game, and this otherwise insignificant night in Utah would turn into the greatest NBA comeback ever. A record that still stands today. Now, this game is an outlier, but any sports fan is keenly aware of both sides of this experience. When you are up, there's an unnerving sensation in the pit of your stomach, an otherwise confusing discomfort in knowing that eventually the other team will stage a run, narrowing the score in nail-biting fashion. And this slice of peace was just an illusion, an eye of the storm. And when your team is down, there's disgust, but there's this lingering flicker of hope, excitement at the first sign of anything positive. Eventually, you know that your team will come back, and you've seen this movie before. But do teams actually play better when they're down and worse when they're ahead? Turns out, they do. This is just a rubber band, but it's actually much more than that. It's symbolic of game flow in seemingly every sport. In fact, it's what this effect is called. And just take a look at this chart by Mike Bowie from Unpredictable on the NBA. Now we've colored this to highlight the effect, but it's really best if I explain it by example. Let's assume that the Boston Celtics are favored by four points at home against the Denver Nuggets. And at the end of the first quarter, the Celtics lead by 14. The point differential is 10 points higher than the spread. If there was nothing atypical or strange about leads, one would expect the Celtics to continue adding on to this lead. They were the favorites by four points. So if there was no rubber band effect, one would expect the Celtics to add three points to their lead. Four point favorites, there's three remaining quarters, so one would expect them to add three more points to their lead. Thus, one would project the Celtics to win by 17 points. However, and anyone that's ever done live betting may have noticed this, due to the rubber band effect, the Celtics would instead be expected to underperform that expectation by five points. So they would be expected to be outscored by two points for the remainder of the game, or putting it all together, they would be projected to win the game by 12 points, not 17 points. And this isn't just my belief. This is what actually happened. In fact, this is what's happened in every modern NBA season. The effect is strongest earlier in the game with larger leads. That diminishing over time, which makes sense because, well, there's just less time to maybe catch up. The stark contrast here is really undeniable. When teams are behind, they tend to outplay the other team, that gap narrowing over time. And vice versa, when teams are ahead, well, they tend to get outplayed, at least relative to the point spread. It's an effect that can even be experienced in video games. At least uh, I like to tell myself so I feel better. The first question that I had about this chart was does it account for selection bias? And Mike said that it did. That's that point spread control. And I realize now as I say Mike, it's, uh, it sounds like I'm talking to third person. I'm not. 
Uh, it's just a byproduct of having the most common name of 44 years in a very confusing childhood. Here's a simpler chart from Nathan Walker. The points per possession falling as the team gets a lead. This seems to happen in just about every sport, football, soccer, hockey, but why? Well, some of this can be explained strategically, and I won't try to tackle each sport here, but when teams are ahead, they maybe shift to more defensive strategies, which makes sense at times. It's a form of risk aversion. But risk aversion is different than risk neutral, as Rao and Goldman pointed out in their paper about the NBA. They noticed that when teams are ahead, they seem to try to avoid risk, taking more twos than usual. This is, in a world where three is quite literally 150% more than two, an inefficient approach, a sign of tightening up. And I'm not just talking purely situational here where you're up four and you maybe want to kill clock and not take an early three. This effect can be seen far earlier in the game. On the contrary, teams that are behind seem to increase their three-point shots. And efficiency seems to increase for both twos and threes, a sign of a more effective offense. In paradoxical fashion, teams that are ahead tend to play in a losing way. And teams that are behind play in a winning way. In my experience, I saw a lot of this. So I was an aggressive basketball player, like many aggressive basketball players, often to my own detriment. I struggled to pick and choose my own moments at times. But one of the things that always confused me, and I thought at least one of my coaches misunderstood, was how to manage a lead. Uh, for example, if we had built up a few point lead in the second half and the other team started pressing us, we would institute our press break, the goal of that being singular, to just break the press, not to exploit an overly aggressive defense if an opportunity presented itself, but rather to just maybe get the ball across half court. Now, clearly this is situational. You shouldn't just maybe go attack a press if you have a five point lead with a few minutes left or there's 30 seconds left in the game and you're up by two. I'm not saying to just go blindly attack a press, but I often found our coach screaming for conservative play early in the game, maybe earlier than we should have been playing conservative when we were up by five at the beginning of the second half. Sometimes even earlier than this. Well, this led to a more passive style and a team with less time to set up their offense. Anyone who has ever played any sport can relate. It's playing to win versus playing not to lose. But this is anecdotal and difficult to measure. So what other reasons are out there? Just thinking through typical game flow, it's entirely possible that the Celtics built this lead because of an outlier quarter. They maybe shot 75% from three in the first quarter, but over time, one would expect a reversion to the average, a reversion to the mean, as they take more threes. But it can't be a reversion because our chart accounts for this. Our chart is using the pregame point spread. Teams are just going beyond this point spread. There's an exaggerated effect, almost as if there's an invisible force pulling these teams back together gravity. Also, shooting efficiency for both twos and threes increased for the team behind. To quote, the trailing team displays an overall boost in efficiency for both shot types. Now one might confuse this increase in efficiency with a popular fallacy, the Monte Carlo fallacy, or for you addicts out there, the gambler's fallacy, a belief that a certain random event is less likely or more likely to happen based on the outcome of previous events. For example, stating that a shooter is due if that shooter's been missing shots. In our example, one might say Denver is due to make more shots because they previously missed shots. Now, much of this has been debated. Thaler's work on the hot hand fallacy comes to mind. It's this whole notion of momentum. Does it exist? What is it? It is a complex subject, perhaps a future video, but still, this is a potential variable here. However, all of this talk about one side of the court for this elasticity, what about the other side of the court? that Seth Partnow put it best when he said that analytically evaluating defenses was kind of like chasing ghosts. 
It's a difficult thing to do. Outside of maybe points per possession or effective field goal percentage of a player within a certain defender's range, it's kind of a difficult thing to gauge. But clearly there are good defenses. There are seemingly good defenders as well. But when we're measuring the rubber band effect, we can't just look at good defenses. We need to consider all defenses. And what we find is, as Nathan Walker mentioned, points per possession drops across the board as the team builds a lead. Is this just caused by better defensive effort and thus a better defense as a team buckles down on the brink of a game maybe slipping away? Or is this just worse offense? Maybe teams, as Goldman Rao pointed out, having worse shot selection as they get ahead, and well, vice versa. It's difficult to know, and I would be wary of anyone giving an absolutist answer here. I mean, I know I've uh, certainly experienced a psychological effect here that many players can relate to. Getting scored on tends to maybe motivate you, might even motivate you more when the coach proceeds to chew you out in the subsequent timeout. Uh, you might even exert a little bit more inertia on the defensive end over the next few possessions. You might even try. Um, now, evaluating the psychological is challenging, just as evaluating the defensive side of the basketball is challenging. But that does not mean by any stretch that one should assume that this is not worth exploring. And this quickly gets into Devin Pope and Jonah Berger's work, Can Losing Lead to Winning? This study looked at over 18,000 NBA games and over 45,000 college basketball games and found that teams that were down by one ended up winning more often than teams that were up by one at half. But another possibility, at least following some psychological literature, suggests that players that are slightly behind might work harder. They might try harder. Now, it should be noted that this paper has been contested, but this idea of loss aversion, it's nothing new. It's been around since 1979 when Tversky and Kahneman won a Nobel Prize for it. Prospect theory, the largely documented idea that losses in this case carry a larger emotional impact than gains of the same magnitude. At halftime or a quarter or a timeout, Staring at the scoreboard and seeing that your team is down might serve as a salient reference point, and consequently, a player that receives this feedback, they might just increase their overall effort. Effort that may shine through on the defensive end. So again, this paper shouldn't be taken as gospel. It's not as straightforward and clear as this rubber band effect that we see across many different sports, across virtually every NBA season. Teams tend to stage comebacks. The difference here being the rubber band effect is looking at outcomes. This paper was trying to use outcomes to determine causation, a far more challenging feat. We might not ever have a full understanding as to what the causation is here, and that's okay. Contrary to most media outlets, we're not looking for a single narrative, a single reason as to why something is occurring. We understand that we're performing a multivariate analysis here, and there's complexity. That does not mean that understanding the outcome in this case, that this rubber band effect exists, is unvaluable. Very clearly, there are coaches, analysts, players that misunderstand this concept of risk, something that has always fascinated me. One cannot avoid risk because not taking risk is a form of risk. There's a risk to paralysis. and Oftentimes, this is the greatest risk. You can't eliminate it. All you can hope to do is measure it. Because if you can measure it, then you can try to manage it. Even at the highest level, risk averse is an oxymoron. And this misunderstanding parlays into much of life. Coming out of college, many of my friends chose safe careers, safe jobs, often citing the low risk nature of said path. But from another perspective, their path was at high risk of not doing something fulfilling with their life. Measuring and managing risk will always be a constant battle, but it's an example of why we shouldn't just trust our gut alone, because intuition is gonna feel just as good when it's right as it does when it's wrong. That's really the purpose, I think, of analytics or statistics is to help with that. Clearly, we have to trust our gut the vast majority of the day. I mean, you wouldn't wanna be driving and doing the trigonometry of changing lanes 
while you're changing lanes. It might lead to more accidents. Uh, very similarly, a coach wouldn't want to be telling a player to think about the calculus of their shot while they're shooting. It might lead to more missed shots. It might be counterproductive. There's always going to be that balance between thinking and doing. Hope you enjoyed the video and make sure to subscribe if you haven't and take care.